before the empty tomb and glorious resurrection, before the scandal of the cross, before Palm Sunday, the calling of disciples, and all the wonders of his ministry. Jesus traveled first to the wilderness, to the solitude and desolation of rock and sand, a king above kings experiencing the hunger and destitution of man. And when the time came for temptation, despite 40 days of deprivation, the Lion of Judah stood firm, confounding every attack with the power of his perfection. In this season of Lent, we share in his sacrifice, not to experience anguish or to portray a counterfeit righteousness, but to draw closer to his holy presence. We withdraw from our distractions. We cast aside treasures and possessions, forsaking all that would separate us from his love. In this desert, he is the source of what sustains us, the joy in our surrender, the peace that surpasses all understanding. He is our hope in Lent. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the Morning Star Methodist Church online worship experience. Today, we begin a brand new message series entitled Journey of Stones. And that's exactly what Lent is. It's a sacred and holy journey. And we're going to take it together here as a community of faith. And each week, we're going to offer you a, 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 an option of what to do with a stone that we hold. Now, if you're in live worship, uh, we'll provide stones for you. But if you're worshiping at home, Go out in the yard and pick up a rock, or if you have a rock hanging around the house or a pet rock, you can use it for this too. But this is going to be a unique worship experience, and I'm so glad that you're here. Before we get into our worship time today, I want to remind you about two quick things. First of all, uh, we have our new Morningstar Methodist shirts that are available. You can order them through the weekly email, or you can call April at uh, 205-678-2572, and she'll help you get online with what all that is about ordering your shirt. And our MDO preschool ministry is opening up. We, we have 30 students now in our preschool ministry. We're really excited about what God is doing there. And registration has opened up for the fall. But Miss Laura also wanted me to mention that they're offering a summer camp for the first time in probably nine years or so. So this summer camp is going to be a great option for your one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, or four-year-old. So I hope that you'll check into that and take advantage if that's something that you could really use for your child and give them some social and community time on top of learning a few things on the side, but we won't tell them that. Well, friends, let's begin our time of worship today here with the journey of stones. Please join me for our opening prayer. Loving God, we lift our souls and search for your promised presence. We want to believe. Help our unbelief. We yearn to follow faithfully. Forgive our hesitant, humbling steps. Reveal yourself to us this day in mighty mountains, in joyous children, in grieving friends, in challenging scriptures, in meaningful prayers, in repentances and forgiveness, in love and grace. Teach us your ways. Lead us in your truth. Guide us on the Lenten journey toward the darkness of death and the hope of resurrection. In the name of the risen Christ we pray, amen.
Hey boys and girls, so today I want to talk to you about somebody that's very special to me. Her name is Daisy. She's one of our doggies. So um, we adopted her almost two years ago and she was, she was a puppy when we got her. And um, Daisy was so energetic and she was so happy. And for weeks and weeks and weeks, all we talked about was Daisy and how much we loved her. And I'm sure Shadow, my older dog, was like, mm, I've had enough of Daisy. But we had not. And we just loved her and loved her and loved her. And she showed how she loved us. It was like everything that Daisy did let us know that she loved us. She would greet us at the door when we arrived home, and she'd be so excited and happy like she hadn't seen us in forever. She would follow us around the house, and she still does. Um, she would sit at her feet. She would give us puppy kisses, and there's nothing better than that sweet, sweet smell of puppy breath, right? She would lick all over our faces. She would bring us her favorite toy. You know, puppy love is just the best. And her actions spoke louder than her words. Kind of reminds me of the lesson that we have today. I'm going to read this uh, verse. The, it's Galatians 5, 6 through 9, but I'm going to read 6 through 9, but then I want to read something else to you too. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. Daisy knew that we loved her. And we knew that she loves us. And I still do love her. She knew that we cared so much for her because of our expressions, because of our actions. The other verse that I want to read is John three sixteen through 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in each person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Again, 1 John three sixteen and through 18. As God's children, we are expected to not only say we love people and we care about someone, but we're also here to practice those things, proving in our actions who we are, proving in our actions that the Holy Spirit is in our hearts, proving in actions that Jesus lives in our hearts. Now, so that kind of brings me back to Daisy who we love so much, and she loves so much without even saying a word. Just like Daisy, we too can express our loves for others. We don't have to do anything grand. Sometimes just a smile or a hug will say, make someone's day. And it makes a huge difference in people's lives. Remember, boys and girls, according to the Bible, Actions really do speak much louder than words. So now we're going to count to three, and we're going to lead our entire congregation in the Lord's Prayer. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have a great week, boys and girls. It was hard to understand, even though you spoke plainly. It was hard to accept that you were to suffer and die. So many had plans for you. Ways that you would save this or establish that, or restore whatever it was we felt needed restoring. Unaware that all along, we were the ones who needed saving. The cost for our souls would be so immense that you knew we would never understand it until we saw it with our own eyes. The cost for saving all who would accept the need to be saved 
would be on a hill of terrible suffering, a cross of unthinkable pain, an unbearable punishment and destiny that was meant for us, and you took, all because you love us. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the beginning of our Lenten journey that we're calling this year the Journey of Stones. I sure am glad that you're here. Now, if you happen to be in live worship, uh, you'll have a real stone that you'll be able to pick up from the table as you enter the worship space. But if you don't have one uh, there at your home or wherever you're listening to this, uh, just grab a rock from outside in the flower bed or from the driveway, and you'll have it for our series today. Now, as we begin this season of Lent, I touched on some things during our Ash Wednesday worship experience that I just want to remind us about of what Lent really is. Because Lent is God's calling for us to rise from the ashes, that our lives are so that we may be transformed through God's grace and salvation offered to us through Jesus. A lot of people think that Lent is just giving up something, but it's actually about what we gain and what we take on. It's a call to shed the burdens of false comfort and prepare us for the purpose for which God has created us. Uh, burdens of false comfort have been around since the beginning of humankind, and we're going to learn about that today. Because today we begin the journey of stones, and we're going to examine a true life account of when an entire group of people fell for what we're calling a false comfort. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever made a promise and then gone back on your word. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about minor disagreements or maybe you made a promise to your spouse to eat at Arby's, but by supper time you didn't feel like eating roast beef. I'm talking about the deep commitments, those agreements that have significant and far-reaching consequences for our lives. Promises that if we break them, uh, they will turn our world upside down. I will say... Uh, I remember this married couple, and just for the sake of this message, I'm going to say their names are Mike and Helen. That's not their real names, though. But they were in love, and they had this beautiful ceremony. They spent a lot of money on it. Their parents did uh, for this wedding ceremony. And it seemed like it was the picture-perfect situation, the picture-perfect marriage, until about two years later uh, when the marriage kind of fell apart due to her infidelity. And Mike and Helen never spoke again except through their attorneys, not ever. Friends, there are consequences to choices that we make, especially when we break solemn and sacred and holy covenants. Today, we're going to learn about this place called Mount Sinai, where Moses went atop Mount Sinai. The children of Israel stayed at the base of that mountain. And this is when Moses was given the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And the story we're going to hear about today and read about in God's Word comes from when Moses steps down from Mount Sinai after being up there for 40 days. That's a key number in the Lenten story. He's been up there for 40 days. Israel has made all these vows. He goes up to speak with God, comes back down with the commandments, and Israel has decided as uh, pretty much as a whole to violate the covenant. Well, you see, friends, when a covenant is broken, it is not easily repaired. Think of it like a, a, an expensive vase. When a promise is made, it is like a gleaming crystal vase. But when a promise is broken, the pieces lie shattered on the floor. Now the story of God's covenant with us goes back more than 6,000 years when a leader named Moses was called high on a mountain to meet with God face to face. Now you see, Moses was already a hero to the people because he led them out of slavery in Egypt into this newfound freedom. And now God was offering these same people a promise, a relationship that was so special the people of Israel could only be known as God's chosen. Now, these are the words that God used when he was describing the Hebrews there. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my special treasure among all the people. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a nation that's set apart for a divine purpose. So Moses goes back up to the mountaintop and he sealed the deal with God. It was not a kiss between lovers like in a marriage ceremony. It wasn't the applause of the angels. It was contract time and God's expectations 
would be written in stone. And it's this part of the story that reminds us of the human nature that we all struggle with. Because being restless may lead to bad consequences. You see, a lot of people think that the Ten Commandments are a killjoy. But the Ten Commandments were actually birthed by God as a loving and protective father would do. He, God displays them for them from a loving and protective heart. And God displays the heart of a loving parent. So make no mistake about it. When God spent these 40 days with Moses, Moses was in the very presence of God. And in fact, the scripture says that his face shone with the countenance of God. And here is the story straight from God's word in Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 9. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron, that's Moses' brother, and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. Aaron said to them, Well, tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a cast metal calf. And they said, This is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they got up early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and got up to engage in lewd behavior. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once. For your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have behaved corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a cast metal calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now, friends, in this text, we're reminded that God will always be truthful even when it doesn't feel good and even though it may hurt our feelings. And for some reason, Aaron buckled under the pressure of the people. They were tired of waiting for Moses to come down from Moses' time with God. And they said, we need a God that we can see. We need a God that we can worship. Now, I'm not really sure why they picked a cow to be the symbol of God for them, but that's what they did. And Aaron took all of their earrings and melted them down and poof, in their eyes, you had a holy cow. So that's what they were worshiping. And Moses comes down from the mountain and he's holding the Ten Commandments, these two tablets, and he sees this that is going on. We'll pick up back in verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work. And the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound of the cry of victory, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but I hear the sound of singing. And as it came about, as soon as Moses approached the camp, that he saw the calf and the people dancing. And Moses' anger burned. And he threw the tablets from his hands, and he shattered them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made and completely burned it with fire, and ground it to powder, and scattered it over the surface of the water, and made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Well, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. In other words, he's saying, Moses, why are you mad at me? You know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. So I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. Then they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. He's acting like he didn't have anything to do with making this image here. It just popped out of the fire looking like a cow. Now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had led them 
had let them get out of control to the point of being an object of ridicule among their enemies. Moses then stood at the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi, they'd later be known as the Levites, gathered together to him. Now, friends, in this text, Moses was furious. And since we're in worship, instead of saying Moses was ticked, let's just say he was spiritually grieved. So when we read this, we may think to ourselves, man, these Hebrew people, they were a foolish people. Just think of all that they had witnessed firsthand with the plagues that God brought on to Egypt uh, there in the Exodus story, or bringing them through the Red Sea and parting the waters. Of all people, the Hebrews knew the true power of God up close and personal through the Exodus story. Friends, maybe we're not all that different from the Hebrews. We want the tangible in our lives just like they wanted at that time. The Israelites wanted it too. They wanted a God that they could see. They were, they were partying, they were dancing, they were singing, they were drinking, they were playing ring around the rosy with their new golden cow. Moses was furious and in his eyes, the deal between God and Israel was off. Now in this story, there is so much symbolism of a Hebrew wedding in this text that it leads us to believe, to believe that God viewed this as the Hebrews committing adultery at the wedding. They all stood at the base of the mountain and said, we do, we do, we do, just like you would do in a marriage covenant. Can you envision the people of Israel seeing how upset Moses was? Are you able to visualize them picking up the pieces of the tablets with thoughts of what might have been? You see, it wasn't Moses who shattered the covenant. Now, he broke the tablets, but it wasn't Moses who shattered their covenant. It was their own selfish lives and the breaking of the promise that they had made to God. Now, friends, it's been more than 6,000 years since Israel broke that promise to God. And we can read about and look at this historical, historical account, and we can wonder how could they have been so foolish to give up their part of the covenant with God. Look at all God had done for them by bringing them out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. But then the honesty of the situation sets in. And we realize that we probably would not have acted any differently than the Hebrews did that day because we break covenants with God all the time, don't we? The Ten Commandments were written in stone. And they were intended to be timeless and changeless expectations from God. But friends, we so often choose to violate them or ignore them or rewrite them to fit our own circumstances. And then we assume that God will look the other way. Well, one of the things that we need to realize about this sacred and holy season of Lent, as God reminded them about almost 6,000 years ago, that God alone wants to be our God. You see, friends, God loves us so much that God continues to pursue us despite our rebellious attitudes. And if God is at the center of our lives, friends, it will be obvious by the way that we live. Now, if our little G God is wealth, popularity, self, putting the success of our children in front of everything that we do, well, then we have broken that which is written in stone. A recent survey revealed that 91% of Americans gossip and lie regularly. Only 27% of those polled believe that honesty is the best policy. You see, we've broken that, which is written in stone. We're told by God not to steal, but even religious people uh, do not tithe to God. Or they fudge a little bit on their taxes and think that nothing is going to happen about it while they're depositing that refund. Academic cheating has reached epidemic proportions on our campuses, but students don't see that as a problem because they think that it benefits them. And it's even easier to do now that AI or artificial intelligence is able to do the schoolwork for them now. Again and again, we have violated that, which is written in stone. Since 1960, here in America alone, there has been an 800% increase in illegitimate births and the family unit is no longer seen as essential today. It's written in stone. Well, when you hear those type of statistics and you see that happening in our community, what is the real issue? 
Well, you see, the issue is not that we have broken the commandments, but rather we are a broken people. We're a broken people, and because we are a broken people, we are a broken society. And if we were to be honest, we're probably feeling guilty, and we're ashamed of the things that we've done or the things that we've said. And the truth is, we have hurt others, we've hurt ourselves, and we've hurt God. And friends, one of the biggest ways that a follower of Jesus can know where they are in their faith journey is when it comes to the very question of sin. When we realize that we have made wrong choices and that we've made decisions, that we know that what we have done is wrong, do we worry about getting caught? Or are we heartbroken because we've heartbroken the heart of God? You see, when we realize that we do not need to defend our need to be right, but to know the truth about our lives and about God, well, friends, that leads to righteousness. And ultimately, we must recognize that we need a Savior who will save us from ourselves. We need a Savior who will love all, who forgives all, and who forgets all. Now, this morning, we hold in our hands a piece of stone. Notice that they are not evenly cut stones. They're rough, they're coarse, some are broken. Some of them are even different sizes. But we have a choice today, as we will with each part of our journey of stones. What will we do with these stones? We can choose to hang on to them as a painful reminder of our sin, and it will continue to make us bitter and broken people. Or... We can choose right here in the beginning of the sacred and holy season of Lent to let them go. We can choose to lay them at the foot of the cross and embrace this new covenant that we have with God all because of Jesus. And I invite you today to leave your broken stone with Jesus as we begin this Lenten journey of stones together. We come into this world seemingly whole, complete, and reliant on ourselves. But in reality, we're simple jars of clay, fragile beings living in a sinful world that get cracked over time until finally something breaks us. When we surrender our hearts, our will, our broken pieces to God, He takes those broken shards of our lives, those jaded and seemingly unusable parts, and slowly over time, God puts them back together. It's not a quick fix. It's not easy. Sometimes it's quite painful, but the end result is a beautiful yet broken vessel that the light of God shines through for all to see. I worship you, I worship you, cause you 
that is who you are we make a miracle work a promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are These are our questions for reflection. Have you ever made a promise and then gone back on your word? Have you ever made a promise and then gone back on your word? Has being restless ever caused you to make some poor choices in life? Has being restless ever caused you to make some poor choices in life? What are some of the golden calves in your life at this moment? What are some of the golden calves in your life at this moment? When you realize what you have done is wrong, do you worry about getting caught or are you heartbroken because you've broken the heart of God? When you realize what you have done is wrong, do you worry about getting caught or are you heartbroken because you've broken the heart of God? Where's your divided heart taking your life right now? Where is your divided heart taking your life right now? What will you choose to do with your stone today? What will you choose to do with your stone today? Please join me for our closing prayer. Now, may the God of the journey, the one who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us, keep us this day and forever. May we continue to celebrate the bounty that God provides, and may we be faithful to continue following wherever the path may lead. Lord, give us the courage to share your story with others and remind them that you are indeed the one true hope of the world. May we all be faithful on this journey of discipleship and live with the kind of hope and love that empowers and encourages others, just as we have been empowered and encouraged by the Spirit of God. We pray this in the holy and sacred name of Jesus today. Amen. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord will be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord will be praised. Well, friends, thank you so much for joining us today as we have officially started our journey of stones together. I look forward to worshiping with you next weekend uh, when we learn more about our brokenness and how God can work through our brokenness to bring a beautiful masterpiece from it. Blessings on you, friends, and we'll worship with you again very soon. <music>